The book of John was written for the express purpose of providing us with undeniable, maybe even ungetoverable evidence as to who Jesus the Christ really is. Matter of fact, if you were going to think of maybe a, a thesis statement that would describe what the book of John is all about, it'd probably be John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, where we read, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. That ye might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now here we find John is telling us just exactly why he provided us with this divine inspired declaration. It's to lead anybody who wants to examine the evidence as to who Jesus the Christ in fact is. And as a matter of fact, that's something that we oftentimes overlook is that the Lord does not want us to believe anything for which there is not sufficient evidence. And once we have sufficient evidence provided, then and only then can we draw the proper conclusion. As a matter of fact, God will go so far as to condemn us for believing something that there's no evidence to lead us to that conclusion. What he wants us to do is to use what is our, at our disposal in this inspired document and based upon that information, upon that evidence, draw the proper conclusion that Jesus Christ is Son of God. And then everything beneficial will result from that. <coughs> so if we find anything that's written in the book of John or, by the way, anywhere within the sacred text, then we know that we have, in fact, what heaven thinks about whatever matter he's dealing with. So when you take the book of John and you go to say the conversation that Jesus is having with a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 and the topic of worship comes up, then you know for a fact that you have heaven's declaration relative to the subject of worship in the context in which Jesus is dealing with. Now, of course, this particular context is somewhat different, especially from the standpoint of this Samaritan woman. She's not used to being talked to in a public way by a man. It's certainly not a Jewish man. And once the conversation begins to get into areas that uh, she'd rather not talk about, like the guy that she's living with right now is not her husband, she sought to change the tone and the tenor and the focus of the conversation to something else. And so she came up with this question as to where the proper place to worship was at. Now the Samaritan said Mount Gerizim was the place. She says, is that right? Or if the Jews had it correct that it's supposed to be in Jerusalem. And of course Jesus responded, the Jews had it correct because salvation, salvation was of the Jews. But then he makes this statement, verse 23. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper now, before you go any further, I want you to underline in your mind that designation for a particular type of worship that Jesus has in mind. True worship. The hour is coming, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such. Such what? True worship. To worship Him. You see, when it comes to the matter of worship, worship and worshipers are in reality a time of day. There's no big deal in people worshiping. And our desire should never be to just be worshipers. Worshiping something. Our desire, and as a matter of fact, we should never be satisfied with anything less than what Jesus identifies here as being a true worshiper. And what's amazing about this verse of Scripture, verse 23, is that Jesus lets us know that it's the Father in heaven who seeks us to be that true worshiper. Now you think about that for a minute. And I know there's some things that John was talking about philosophy and, and some of that philosophy stuff will just, I mean, give you a headache and everything else, confuse you about so many things. But there's some times that we need to think a little bit more intently about what's involved in actually being able to do what God expects us to do. And God has never expected out of anybody anything they couldn't do with His aid. Therefore, I know 
that if the Father seeks such, and the such that is true worshipers to worship Him, then we can do it. We can be that true worshiper. <clears throat> we can be the true worshiper that the Father seeks to worship Him with the assurance not only that we can fulfill the bill of being true worshipers, but get this, the Creator and Sustainer of the universe will accept our offer of worship. Now that's profound. Especially when you look at yourself in the mirror and see how lacking you are in so many things. But to realize that God will accept my offer of worship to Him, that should cause me to, to pause from time to time and, and make sure I realize just how amazing this is. And what a privilege and an opportunity is granted to us, feeble and finite as we are, that He will in fact take from us what we offer Him if we fulfill the requirements of being true worshipers, worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. Because after all, it's the Father who seeks those types of people, true worshipers, to worship Him. Now, of course, verse 24 is a passage we're more familiar with. God's Spirit, they that worship Him, must worship Him in spirit and truth. But the idea of worship here and the realization that we as mere human beings can provide for the Creator and Sustainer of the universe something that He will accept from us, I dare say that's something that we need to think about. I would even go so far as to say that we might ought to ponder that intently and sincerely every time we attempt to worship the Father. When you think of the word that's translated most of the time in the New Testament as worship, the word is proskuneo. It literally means toward the kiss. And of course, we flip it around because it reads a little bit better, you know, to kiss towards. The idea of kissing the hand towards. I've seen movies, you know, of a king or a queen who come into an assembly, you know, and, and here's all the subjects that are bowing and they're kissing their hand like that. Well, what are they doing? Well, first and foremost, it's more than a feeling that they're doing. They're actually engaging in actions that demonstrate a respect and a reverence for one who is deserving of that reverence and respect. And that's what true worship is. By true worship. There's more than a feeling involved in being a true worshiper. Now obviously feeling is necessary and we'll see later on in the lesson. But there's actually actions <coughs> that are performed by us as true worshipers. In demonstrating a proper mindset and a respect for the one who is deserving of that. Now, since that is the case, and it is because that's what the word means, then maybe, just maybe, in our assemblies, when we are gathered together, at least we claim to be, to worship God, maybe we need to think a little bit more intently about what we're doing. And sometimes, and I know how this is, because I don't want to run away from a, a true biblical concept just because a concept has been uh, stolen by false doctrine and promo uh, promoters of error, for sure. But but think about it just in our song service, you know. When a brother stands up before us and he announces his own number and, and we say, what is it? Well, so I say, well, he's a song leader. Well, yeah. But think about it in reality as to what we're engaging in doing if we're trying to follow the inspired prescription of John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. He is in reality more than just a song leader. He's a worship leader in song. Now that means that we could, in all reality, have the song pitched just right where everybody that sings parts can sing their part without too much trouble. And beat it out just exactly like it's written. You know? And all say the same words at the same time like it's supposed to. And our worship never get past the seed. Amen. 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 If we're just singing song. But if we're worshiping God in song, and there is actually been some forethought and some planning that went into the selection of song, now then we're <coughs> zeroing in on the possibility that you know what? True worship might could possibly take place, right? Here. And I'd be a participant in. You cannot accidentally be a true worshiper. Just like you can't accidentally make it to heaven. 
The reason why you're a true worshiper is you know what's required to be a true worshiper, and that's what you're determined you're going to be. There are some religions, of course, that while they wouldn't dare say it, it's implied in everything you do, leave your brain outside, you don't need it in here. Let me tell you something, that's not primitive New Testament Christianity. Because you can't do primitive New Testament Christianity without using your brain. It's required. We've got to love God with our mind. We've got to use our intellect. We have to think about what we're doing and do what we're doing because we know that's what the Lord wants us to do. And we're thankful that we understood <laughs> enough that we could. And we know that everybody else could too. And it goes not just for a song service, but when a prayer is led. I mean, Steve, was it? Steve's our prayer leader. Okay. Or, more correctly, the words that Steve chose out of his own mind became the words that I was thinking at the same time. As we together went before the throne of God and petitioned Him for blessings and in behalf of those in need of special favors and, and everything else. But He's leading our thoughts as it becomes our prayer. If He is just prior leader, then we'll say, I can't believe He's saying that again. Is, is that fine repetition? He says that every time. Yeah. Or I can't believe he misnamed that person or, or this, that, other. But if it's worship before the throne of God in prayer, that's <coughs> something all good. And it just so happens that in this part of our service, guess what? I'm more than a talking hand up here. Amen. I'm actually leading us in an examination about what the Bible says about true worship. And I'm not up here, you know, to be graded on reckon how many times that hick's going to uh, betray the rules of grammar in the English language, you know. Or like one guy told me one time, he said, Fred, did you realize, and this is a long time ago, I think when I preached 12 minutes one time, he said, did you know you put your hand in your pocket 37 times? <laughs> I'm sure there was true worship going on in his mind, don't you? 37 times? You know, it reminds me of a story about Gus Nichols. He was accosted at the back door one time and was accused of some well-meaning sister, I know, of using the word breeches in the sermon. And of course, Brother Nichols did not remember using the word breeches. And he said, ma'am, I, I sure am sorry that you took offense at the use of that word. What was it I said? I, well, I said breeches. And she said, I can't remember. And he said, well, what did I say right after I said breeches? She said, I don't know that either. He said, well, it's a good thing I said preachers. You wouldn't heard a thing I said. <laughs> if, our, if preachers are on display as to trying to catch them in mispronouncing something or, or misusing the English language or misidentifying the past scripture, then obviously we're thinking about the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing in our attempts at least at being engaged in true worship. And when we eat the Lord's Supper. I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. First thing I remember ever playing is church. I mean, at four and five years old, I was the oldest, so I got to preach, I got to lead singing, I got to wait on the table. My little brother and little sister had, just, had to wait in the wings, you know, every now and then I let them do something. But at four and five, six year old, you can play Lord's Supper. But you know, there's a a certain degree of spiritual maturity that's required in order to eat the Lord's Supper. The distinction between true worship and playing worship maybe is a distinction that has not been properly examined. Now you can might figure, you know, with something as so demanding, and I'll just tell you it is. When we are assembled on the first day of the week to remember the death of Christ on the cross, then we're doing battle constantly to concentrate on what we're engaged in doing. I mean, don't feel like a lone ranger if you have difficulty concentrating. If you've got a grandchild poking in the, in the side on one side and then somebody clipping their fingernail behind you. you know, It's a constant battle to keep your mind attuned to what you're engaged in doing. Yeah. Without a doubt. It's a difficult thing and a demanding thing to be a true worshiper. It's not that easy. But the benefits and the blessings that go along with it makes it a necessity. It really should surprise us that all the way back through history, yeah. we have example after example 
in the scriptures of those who simply failed in their attempt to be true worshipers. And we know why. Because it's specified in each instance. Think about the first example. The fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. Here's two boys. Their names are Abel and Cain. Cain is a children of the ground. Abel is a herdsman. He's taking care of sheep. Abel brings to the first of his flock and the fact they're all an offering of the Lord. While Cain brings the fruit of the ground. God has respect in Abel and his sacrifice. But in Cain and his sacrifice, he didn't have respect. And Cain knows it. And then Cain got mad. He's puffed up. And I'm just paraphrasing what happened here. But here's what God said to Cain. He said, Cain, you're being given an opportunity to nip it in the bud. You can stop right here. Realize that you've messed up. Don't be jealous of your brother. Don't be envious of what he's done. But if you don't nip it in the bud right here, it's probably going to get worse than it is right now. Guess what? Cain didn't nip it in the bud. And he didn't kill his brother. He didn't kill his brother. Well, what was the problem there? You know, was the problem with the worship of Cain? Did, did he pull his little old pocket knife out and, and make him a little god out of wood and bow down to it? No. He wasn't engaging in idolatry. He simply thought that he could substitute for what God said to him that God would accept him. Somebody says, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that from putting together a few passages of Scripture that lead to that other not conclusion. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered unto God and works the sacrifice to Cain. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Therefore, God told those two boys what to do in worship. Amen. Abel did what God said and Cain did what he wanted to do. That's pretty simple. But how many of our religious friends and neighbors understand that principle? It's still there. You know, that's one that we must stress to them. So the problem was not that he was trying to worship a different God than Abel, but he found out very quickly that it was a demanding and a difficult thing for his standpoint to be a true worshiper. Jump ahead a few centuries to the 10th chapter of the book of Leviticus. Okay? Here we've got two more boys as an example. <coughs> Their names are made out and by him. They offer strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Fire went out from the Lord and devoured those two boys. What's the problem? Were they engaging in idolatry? Do they pile up some rocks and pour some oil on top of rocks and, and chant that no? No, they were attempting to worship the God of heaven. But they again presumptuously thought that they could substitute for what God prescribed and expect God to accept it. He won't accept substitute. And it cost them their life. Now most of the time we get that. And when I say we, I, I mean we that are members of the body of Christ. We understand that principle. But I'll tell you something. There is no doubt in my mind that a large percentage of many congregations believe about worship that as long as we do not have a woman in the pulpit, and as long as we do not have a trap sand or a piano over in the corner picking and grinning, then that guarantees that our worship is acceptable. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, if our worship is acceptable, obviously, we're not going to have a woman in the pulpit and mixed assembly. We're not going to have instrumental music in our worship. But that doesn't guarantee our worship is acceptable. We need to look at the other side of the coin of this true worship matter. And I think one of the best places to do that is is in the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 1 real quick. The first verse of this book, of course, gives us a timeline of what we're talking about. Who happens to be king during the exploits of this great prophet, uh, Isaiah. But then notice how the attention turns to the, to the problem at hand in, in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, I don't know if this is just because I'm getting older, you know, or what. But I am getting to the point where I'm firmly convinced that the greatest of sins is ingratitude. I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm more aware of instances in which people <laughs> are guilty of that sin. I don't know. Ingratitude. God says, I've nourished and brought up children. Who's talking about children? 
And how did they show their appreciation for what God had done for them? They rebelled against Him. Is anything more heart reaching than a rebellious child? Does anything tear your guts out more than a kid that turns against all you've taught him against you and against God? I can't imagine anything worse than that. Well, that's what God's experiencing. It. Now, none of them surely would have been so foolish to say, well, when did you ever do anything for us? Well, of course they know what God done for them. I mean, they're taken out of Egypt, ten plagues on the Egyptians to demonstrate God's <coughs> power over all the the heathen gods and deities of the Egyptians. They march across the Red Sea on dry ground. They go to Mount Sinai, receive the law. They're fed with manna and with quail and water from a rock. Their clothes don't wear out. God goes into the land of Canaan. As they go across another body of water, the Jordan River on dry ground, He's like a hornet before them. He's fighting all their enemies. What's God done for them? Everything. And how did they demonstrate their appreciation? They rebelled against God. And then the next verse is the one that really gets me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's creed. But Israel doesn't know. My people don't consider. Now, I've worked on the farm at different times. You know, I've cut cows, I've put reins in pigs' noses, you know, I've fixed fences and stuff. But, but as far as knowing all the intricacies and details of farm life, I don't. But people in the know have told me this. That the dumbest animals on the farm are oxes and asses. Now if that's the case, and they know what they're talking about. Notice what God is saying. God says the dumbest animals <coughs> on the farm have more sense than Israel does. Whoa. Now how likely do you think it is they're going to read past verse number three? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe. But the ox knows who takes care of it. The ass knows. I mean, animals see a pickup truck and a certain color of pickup truck come through the gate and they know there's going to be something to eat in the back of it. And they'll follow that, follow that pickup truck off. They know the fellow in overalls and the silly looking hat is going to put water in this bed over here. And I'm going to be able to drink some. <coughs> animals know that. But does Israel know? Now what's amazing and why that figures into this lesson so prominently is when you go a little bit further over here in this first chapter, you see that during this whole time in which they are ignorant of heaven, they're just worshiping away. Not only that, they are worshiping with the right form. They're worshiping with the right offering of sacrifices. They're using the right terminology. They're saying the right words in their prayer. And in the midst of all of their religious and worship activities, God says, folks, if you can't do any better than this, you might as well just stay at home. There ain't that many people are aware of that God of the Bible. What's the problem here? I mean, we're doing it. Maybe at some point in time as a if some well-meaning uh, Israelite is listening to these words in the, uh, this first chapter, he says, has God changed his mind? I mean, we know what Leviticus chapter 23 says. We know about what we're supposed to be offering, and that's what we're doing. But what's the problem? They were doing the right things at the right time, saying the right words, but where was their heart? These are the very people. And the book of Isaiah is the very prophet from whom Jesus is quoted in Matthew chapter 15 when he says, this people draw nigh and with the mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. Far, far, far away. Doing the right thing? Sure. Right time? Yeah. But they're worship? What he said? They weren't true worship. Now somebody might say, well the reason why you can't properly classify them as true worshipers is because they did not know nobody. Well, that's obviously a contributing factor for sure. But how is it that they can be said to not even know God and that animals know who takes care of them more so and has a deeper relationship with the farmer than does God's people have with him? How is that possible? And when you're talking about people 
like we are, you know, limited as many in so many ways as we are in comparison to God, how is it possible for us to actually be in a position where we can claim truthfully to know God? I mean, is that possible or is that some type of philosophical terminology and, and ideas that's not possible for us to grasp the whole of? Why? If it was that case, then it wouldn't be required. If it's difficult, don't worry about it. It's not that difficult. Because everybody understand it. Let me ask you something. You remember in uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, we read about a man with a man of Enoch. Fifth chapter of the book of Genesis. And concerning Enoch, of course, he was translated, didn't see death, but this testimony he had was that he walked with God. And I think about that for a minute. You know, I said, well, man, he didn't live to be as old as some of those fellows back there, but, but Enoch, you know, he was a human being just like we are. And he had to eat and sleep, and, you know, and get his rest, you know, and he had to do all the physical things that we have to do. Sure. But yet, here is a declaration, an inspired declaration concerning something about the relationship that exists between Enoch and God in that he walked with God. And then in the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 6, here's another fellow, the land of Noah, and it says concerning Noah, he walked with God too. And I think, well, wait a minute here. Here are guys who are more like me than dislike me, you know. They have the same same difficulties I have. They have the same needs that I have. And yet, here it is an inspired statement concerning both of them that they walked with God. What does that mean? We know that God's a spirit. He doesn't possess flesh and blood like we do. And yet, here's some kind of concept in which they were walking together. Remember what that means. Reckon that would be sort of synonymous with them actually knowing God to some extent? Would you think that maybe to be able to actually be saying that somebody walked with God, that would be a pretty good indication that they know God in order to walk with Him? Sure. I, how do I know Tim? How do you know anybody? I know Tim through communication. Through, limited as we are in our ability to communicate, we communicate. Talk to each other. Is that an avenue that's open so that people might, like even Enoch and, and Noah, could know God? Is there a line of communication open where people can talk to God? That God can talk to us? For sure. Did God talk to them? Not they, my phone did. Did God talk to Enoch and Noah? Sure. Did Noah and Enoch talk to God? Sure. Now, while we don't talk to God face to face, we better be talking to God in prayer. Does He talk to us? Sure He does. Right? <clears throat> so the communication lines are there so that we might truthfully be said to be able to know God. Well, what other aspects are there that make it possible for Enoch to walk with God and Noah to walk with God? How about fellowship? How about terminology we use a whole lot in our day and age when people are in agreement, we say they're on the same page with each other. You think that Enoch and God are on the same page with each other? Yeah. When God told Noah that He's going to destroy the world, you think that Noah was on the same page with God? Sure he was. I mean, the last verse of Genesis chapter 6 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. So that testifies to the fact that there was communication taking place. And it also testifies to the fact that Noah was trying to please God. They were in fellowship with each other. Can, can we know God like that? Friends and brethren, that's the only way we can know God. Amen. It's through communication and association. You know, you remember the psalmist? He said in the 119th Psalm, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Now I'm going to go on a limb here and I'm going to say this. I think that not only is it proper, but I think it's required to hate the things God has. And to love the things God loves. And to support the thing that God supports. And to stand totally opposed to the things that God stands totally opposed to. Because I want to be on the same page with God. I want to view things as God views things. I mean, what does it mean to be Christ-like and godly? If it's not thinking the way that Christ thought about things and reacting to things the way Jesus did. And when I do that, we're talking about a relationship that exists that could be described as walking with God which would lead to the obvious conclusion 
that we can worship a God we know. Israel didn't know. They didn't know God. Now, they could have, but they didn't. Yeah. It reminds me, you know, when, when Paul was in uh, fixing to preach on Mars Hill and, and uh, Athens in Acts chapter 17, when they went to the city, you know, and he's waiting on his buddies to catch up to him, and he looks out over the city, and he says, a city given wholly to idolatry. And it says, Luke's record says that his spirit was stirred within him. Really, what was that all about? I mean, what got him so upset here that he just couldn't keep his mouth shut anymore, anymore? He had to get it started off. Well, it had to be something like, look at these highly intelligent people that live in this town. And look at all the idol worshiping they're engaged in doing. How could somebody so smart be so dumb? And he used that opening to tell them about the true God ever. And remember, as he saw this one idol of inscription to the unknown God, he said, Whom therefore you worship in spirit and truth. No, that's not what he said. He said, Whom therefore you ignorantly worship. You cannot be a true worshiper of a God you don't know. Amen. It's impossible. Now, that doesn't mean that we ever get to the point where we say, well, boy, I'm glad I've topped out on the knowing God and knowing Christ uh, position now where I can just sort of coach the rest of the way. That never come. And while we should ever be striving for a greater understanding and appreciation of what God's done for us, I know for a fact that I know God more now than I did a year ago. Because I want to, and you do too. We want to become more Christ. The way God designed it, see, is that as you grow older, you develop the qualities and characteristics of Christ because that's what you've determined you're going to do. It's not like say, okay, when I retire, then press no change or I'm going to become Christ like. That's never the way it works. Most of the time, those older, godly ladies in the congregation, just a few years ago, they was those middle aged godly ladies. Then a little bit before that, they was those young married couple godly ladies. And they develop over the years. True worship? Yeah. Now, what should the attitude be? Yeah. Well, turn right over real quick to the chapter 6. Here in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 6. Because here's a, a reason why the attitude of the Israelites of Isaiah's day, at least at this time frame, were maybe feeling a little bit uh, without leadership. Because the king had died. Well, they didn't know. It didn't matter who's on the throne. They still had king on the throne. God's always on the throne. And so what Isaiah is given is either uh, a vision of heavenly worship or in some fashion a picture of what happens around the throne of God when God is worshipped by angelic beings. Because that's the picture we have here at the beginning of chapter 6. Notice. The Lord sitting on His throne, verse 1, high and lifted up, and His train fills the temple. Train is, of course, that which flows behind the garment, you know, that comes in, that we usually associate with a bride as walking down the aisle. Above it, this place of worship, stood seraphim, angelic beings. These angelic beings have six wings, three sets of two. With two of these wings, He covered His face. With two of these wings, He covered His feet. And with two of these wings, He flew. And one of them cried to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of glory. The whole earth is full of His glory. And at that sound of that angelic being hollering, Holy, 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 the foundation of that building shook and it was filled with smoke. Now, we're just hurriedly running over that. But try to put yourself just for a minute in the, in the samples of Isaiah as he sees this, as he's experiencing this. Pretty profound, if you think about it. How, how would you respond? Well, I know how some would they say. I feel a song coming on, give me a microphone. And that's not what he did. As a matter of fact, he responds <coughs> the very opposite of probably what most people would think they're supposed to respond to, especially those people who are ignorant of what true worship is to begin with. You know what Isaiah said? Isaiah says, Woe to me. Woe is me. You mean to tell me that Isaiah, at this very moment in his life, after he's experienced and seen with his own eyes, heavenly worship around the throne of God, 
her angelic beings holler, holy, holy. The foundation shakes. It's full of smoke. And he starts looking at his littleness in comparison to a holy, holy, holy God. What if? What if that's the beginning point of developing into true worship? You mean that I look at myself in comparison to the God that I'm attempting to worship and realize there's absolutely nothing that I have done that's deserving of being able to do this? Isaiah says, Woe is me. I'm a man of clean lips. And everybody I run around with is just bad shapes on me. And yet I've been able to see the King of Glory. Now, I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, trying to get you to believe that buying into it, accepting what the Bible says about true worship is going to answer every problem that we face. But I guarantee you one thing. It'll take care of a whole lot of it. If we use these biblical examples like the attitude of Isaiah right here. Because notice what happens just a little bit later in this very same context. The Lord says, we need somebody to go. Who will go for us? Who's going to go for us? Who can we send? And Isaiah raised his hand and said, Send him. He's a preacher. He ain't doing nothing else to him. <laughs> he says, Well, what's the elders for? I never <coughs> figured out what they're doing in him. Send him. That's not what he's doing. Isaiah has the audacity to say, Here am I. Send me. Reckon there's any correlation between what he has experienced, what he's seen with his own eyes, the attitude that he manifests here when he says, woe is me, and now the willingness to go? Reckon that is the direct result of having the proper attitude at the beginning here that would cause him to do that? Let me tell you something. Whenever you have a group of people who realize that worship is a privilege a privilege. A privilege that a holy, holy, holy God desires out of us and that we can give Him and realize it's His own littleness in comparison to that holy, holy God. When a person realizes that, you don't have to hold a cattle prod on them to get a show up for services. You know, they're anxious and thankful for opportunities to engage in true worship as true worship. Isaiah one. And we can't be too. You see, you know, I can quote Hebrews 10 25 until I'm blue in the face. And I am. I can even put the ones in front of it and one after it, try to add a little bit of motivation to it, you know. Consider one another to provoke and love of good work. But if a person has no problem at all forsaking the opportunity to be exhorted with brethren and by brethren together in worship, then there's a deep problem below the surface there that you're trying to put a band in. Somebody doesn't look upon true worship as a privilege of special ones. And those special ones are those who have determined they're going to be true worshipers. Now, what's interesting, real, real fast, now I'm sorry. In the book of Micah, let's turn over to Micah chapter 6 real quick. <clears throat> Micah chapter 6. Because at the same time that Isaiah here is preaching in the town, Micah is out preaching in the suburb. Like that way out, you know, in a small town like that. And in verse 6, of all things here, in, in Micah chapter 6, he's dealing with the same topic, the same general problem of associated with their worship. Now, of course, it has to do with their attitude that's got them in this position, but he's preaching about and talking about worship. Notice what he, he posits for them in verse 6. Where we shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Now, here's, here's some possibility. How am I to approach the throne of God in worship? Is there, is there anything from the Lord on that? Well, sure there is. And then he asks some questions. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? But would that work? 
Well, since that what that's what the Lord requires, I'd say that probably get. Yeah. yeah. Well, what if, you know, what if I want to ratchet it up a little bit, you know? What if, you know, I'm not satisfied with just what the Lord says? What if would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rains? And instead of just a little bit of oil, what about rivers of oil? <coughs> would that get God's attention? And what if I really showed how dedicated and determined I was? And what if I offered my firstborn child as a burnt offering for the sin of my soul? Would that impress God? Well, you might get CNN to show up and videotape it, you know. I mean, who knows? Matt Lyer and, and uh, NBC News might show up and want to see something about that. Might chat the papers might show up. You got all this bloodletting and all these rivers of oil, you know, and here you're killing a child on live TV, you know. Yeah, but will I impress God? No. I don't impress God. Flashing lights, neon signs, and all that stuff. Worldliness. That's carnality. That's the very opposite of spirituality. But yet the world eats that up. No. That's not true work. What does the Lord, what does the Lord require of me? Oh, verse 10. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy. And to walk home with our God. That's boring. There's no pizzazz to that. There's no big flashing lights and neon signs to that. No, no, no. Here's a person who recognizes that in the community in which he lives, so many, that he's a representative of the holy, holy, holy God. And he speaks a word for the Lord every opportunity he has. And when there's justice that demands his <coughs> participation and standing up for it, he does it. He's good neighbor. He takes care of those things that need to be taken care of because he knows the extent of the love of God in that community. He can know. Even if nobody knows his name, God does. And that old fella can know that he is a true worshiper. <coughs> Worshiping the Father in spirit truth because that's the type of fountain that the Father seeks to worship in. And he can know that God is pleased with his worship. And get this. If God is pleased with his worship, who cares what he loves? What does it matter what he loves? If God is pleased with what I'm doing, that satisfies me just fine. And that should satisfy. That's all. You see, the hour is coming, and now it is. When the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God the Spirit, they that worship Him, absolutely must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Thank you so much for your kind of Amen.